Father, as we open your word today, we ask that you would help us to see where you're working. Help us to understand your plan. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to see and celebrate what you're doing right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are continuing with the sermon series, Looking Back and Looking Ahead. And last week, Pastor Daniel shared with us the important importance of remembering. We want to remember what God has already done in our lives. And then I want to ask you how many of you uh, took time to remember and then to kind of put markers down for those things that God has already done in your life. Did you take time? If you didn't, take time this week to remember what God's already done. Then, don't stop there. Share his faithfulness. Share his faithfulness. The things he's done are a testimony of his goodness. We want to share that with everybody. It's important that we remember. Um, So let's always remember that Jesus suffered great injustice so that we could be forgiven. Jesus gave his life so that we could be set apart from death, set free from death, and receive eternal life. And Jesus is with us always, strengthening us every day, every step of the way. We have a lot to give thanks for. So let's not forget to do that. Well, today, uh, we want to look at what God is doing right now. We want to celebrate what God is doing right now. Well, let's be honest. Let's be honest. It can be difficult to see what God is doing in the present. We can kind of look with hindsight and say, oh, look what God was doing during this time that we just walked through. Or we can look with eyes of faith and say, God, this is what I desire you to do. But seeing what God is doing right now is often blocked by our circumstances and situation. They just loom so large in front of us that we can't quite capture what God is doing. And these days in particular, with all the protests, the anger, the violence, the destruction, it can leave us wondering, what in the world is God doing? Has he abandoned us completely? So let me just start by saying, no, God has not abandoned us. He's at work. He's present and at work among us. But that being said, none of us can see the whole picture of what God's doing. None of us has the whole picture. But but we we can have little see little bits of what he's doing. Most of us have been given eyes to see a little bit of what God's doing, but none of us can see all of it. I've been given eyes to see a portion of what he's doing, and today I want to share with you what that portion is. I want to try to help you see through my eyes to see what God is doing. Now, you may see the same picture, or or you may see something a bit different. That's okay. That's all right. God gives us each a a, a little viewpoint, a a bit of what he's doing. I'm just going to try and share what he's given me. Okay? Allow me to start off with a story that can help you understand why I see what I see, what I'm looking for. So it begins uh, 4 a.m. November 8, 2016. In a few hours, I would be among the many that would go to the polls and cast my ballot. And I was in deep anguish. I had deep concerns about both candidates. So I was up seeking the Lord about the candidates. Lord, what is your will in this? What do you, what do you want? What do you want to do? What's your will? And in the midst of my anguish and prayer, I heard the Lord speak. And he said, Steve, if Hillary Clinton is elected, the country will be diminished by corruption. And if Donald Trump is elected, the country will be diminished by the sword. 
I thought, well, God, that's not really a good picture. This is not encouraging. Either way, we lose. Then he said, but Steve, either way, my will will be done. My plan is being carried out. I'm in control. Be at peace. Ah. Well, I only shared that prophetic word with a handful of people when, it, when I received it. A couple in this group I was shared with and a couple of others. But ever since I received that, I've been watching to see it be fulfilled day by day. I would have never believed the amount of hidden corruption that has been unhidden and is being unhidden. And I believe that that word was true. If that corruption was not unhidden, it would have diminished our country. And I look at all the anger and the violence and the destruction these days, and I wonder, is that what God meant by the sword, or, or is it something else? Am I still looking for something else? Certainly that destruction and looting, that's diminishing our country. But the most important words that I received are the, are the words that God's will will be carried out, that he's actively at work. And so, as I look at all these current events, I, I kind of see, okay, what were you saying? Is this what's happening? But God, what are you doing? You are active and at work in the midst of this mess. What are you doing? How are you doing it? And what are you working to accomplish? How will you use me? How will you use us in that mix? So as I look at these current pandemic and protests, I'm looking for, God, what do you want us to do in the midst of this to fulfill your plan? Well, as we begin today and to look at what's happening around us, I, I want to say right up front that the parts that I've seen of, of what happened to George Floyd are a horrendous case of injustice. And I don't want to in any way minimize the need for justice in his case. I don't want to minimize that. But I also want to say that what happened to Officer Dorn and, and the business people who, who lost their businesses in the, ma in, in the midst of demonstrations and, and violence, those are horrendous acts of injustice as well. And they also deserve justice. So with everything that I say, anything that I say today, I am not minimizing the need for justice, and I'm not saying that, that we as a country don't have room for improvement. I believe every one of us has great room for improvement. I'm not trying to minimize anything. I'm just to share you with you what I see. So let's get talking about what I see happening and, and, and where I see God at work. First, we have to understand that, that we are in a battle. We're in a battle, and that battle is raging on at least three fronts. And I'm going to talk to you about the three fronts of that battle today briefly. The first front is, is the, in the political front. Uh, most of what we see and hear has been chosen, edited, scripted, so to influence us in one way or another. We're not seeing the whole picture. It has been chosen so that it will get us riled up to move us one way or the other. The people responsible for this part of the battle often work behind the scenes. They quietly get others riled up to do their bidding. Most times they don't really care about justice or injustice. What they care about is power and control. Their call to arms is simple. simple. They whisper, you know, if we have power and control, then your lives will be better. If, if we don't have power and control, <gasps> your lives are going to be miserable. Join our side. We've got to be careful that we don't allow them to lure us into becoming pawns in their battle. 
That's the first front, the political front. The second front of the battle is a battle for social agenda. The ones fighting on this front most concern themselves with benefits. What can I get out of this? The influencers on this battlefront like to talk about fair and unfair. In other words, they work to get us to compare ourselves to others. Their siren call is, you deserve more. Take it. But we need to understand that, that they're not at all concerned about fair and unfair. They're really only, their only goal in, in mind is, what can I get for me? Many people, many of us who have hearts and really uh, want to see justice, we get seduced by that siren call because fair and unfair seems like a justice term. We, don't, we, we have to be careful that, that we don't join a force that at its heart is really motivated by greed. The third front, and the front I really want to concern us with today, is the spiritual battle that's going on. There is a spiritual battle that is raging. The enemy of our souls is working to close down our hearts. He's working to divide us and conquer us. He wants us to, to be suspicious of each other rather than trusting. He wants us to respond out of fear rather than love. And he wants our witness to be ineffective rather than active and productive. That's his goals in this battle. And allow me to show you the lines on which this battle is being fought. First, the enemy is working to get us to believe that power and control are the ultimate necessity, necessity for our survival. You hear that, right? You hear the rally cry, join our side. We must win in order to gain power and control. All is lost if we don't gain it or don't maintain it. All is lost. Jesus said, look, anyone who wants to be first must be the last, the very last, and servant of all. Those who want to lead cannot concern themselves with gaining and maintaining power and control. They have to conserve them, con concern themselves with serving others. To overcome this battle, we've got to change our measuring stick. The measuring stick by which we measure candidates you see, the, the, the spiritual battle is this. We must resist these who want power and control. Resist allowing them to redefine what it means to be a leader. True leaders are servants. And I dare say, and, and I apologize for getting political, but I don't care whose side you're on. If you look at Congress, you will see that the majority of the people that are supposedly serving us have most concerned themselves with power and control, and they need to be gone from there. I'm just saying that out loud. We've got to redefine what it means to be a leader. We've got to maintain what Jesus says leaders are. We've got to be those leaders. That's the first battle line. The second battle line is they're setting up battle lines against the core teachings of the Bible. Recently, I learned that because I'm a white male, I am evil. Now, y'all may agree with that. But the fact is that that's a complete lie. I am sinful because I'm part of the human race. Every one of you is too. Not because I'm white or, or you're green. 
It's because we're part of the human race. God's Word says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, the enemy's trying to convince us that one group is worse than another. But the fact is that we're all deficient. Every one of us. We all need Jesus. I've failed. You've failed. Can we forgive each other our failures? See, that's what followers of Jesus do, right? Can we forgive each other? The enemy tries to get us to compare ourselves with each other. He likes to get us feeling superior or inferior to each other. It doesn't matter which one. Either way, he wins. Recently, I learned that I have something called white privilege. And I guess I do. I guess I do. Let me describe what that looks like for you. I had two brothers and two sisters, two older sisters, one older brother, one younger brother. I was fourth in the line of five. My dad was always in Christian service, so we never had much. Growing up in second and third grade, I remember that I had one pair of shoes, wingtips. Anybody remember wingtips? They're good shoes. I had one pair. Uh, Wingtips, if you recall, had leather-soled bottoms. The the soles were leather. And and when a kid is in the playground playing on the asphalt or on the concrete, leather doesn't hold up very long. So I ended up with one pair of shoes with holes in the bottom. And, And I can remember my dad, because we couldn't afford new shoes, couldn't afford to have those repaired, would cut out cardboard so I could put them in the bottom of my shoe. And by the end of the day, the cardboard was worn through and so was my sock. And my mom would have my socks darned and we'd begin it over again. Privilege. The privilege is I had a mom and dad. My brother is one year older than me. We didn't have a bike until my sister outgrew hers. Then we had a bike to share. Whenever we went to our friend's house, one of us would ride and the other would run alongside. Now remember, I was the younger brother, also known as the runner. We didn't have ice skates in the wintertime. So our friends would be out on the pond skating, and we'd go out there in our shoes and slip slide around. Until one day, my parents said, you know, we've got to do something, and they got us a pair of ice skates to share. What a blessing. What a privilege. We shared our clothes, my older brother and I, through junior high school, until my older brother became embarrassed to be seen in clothes that I had worn. His clothes were the nicer ones. Mine were the hand-me-downs. I always liked to wear his clothes. They looked nice. But from that point on, I had the hand-me-downs. That was it. What a privilege. I had the privilege of going to a private Christian school. Not everybody gets that privilege, but I also had the privilege of doing what they called work study. Work study means that I stayed after school to sweep the floors, wipe the desk, wipe the chalkboard, empty the trash while everyone left. And I can still remember the stares and sneers of my friends. Friends. And I finished my work there so that I could go home and complete my newspaper route so that I'd have a little bit of spending money. That was all at the age of 12 and 13. In 10th grade, I was blessed. Someone died, and I got their clothes. You never call somebody dying a blessing, but I was blessed. 
Can you imagine how great it felt as a teenager wearing some old dead guy's way out of fashion clothes? It was humiliating. It was emotionally traumatizing. So starting as a 15-year-old, as a junior in high school, I got a job in the evenings and on weekends so that I could buy my own clothes. So that I could have spending money to do things with my friends. That's what white privilege looked like for me. Now, don't get me wrong. I was blessed with parents. I was blessed with parents that loved me. And I had many other blessings. But if you'd look at me today, you would not know any of the difficulties that I went through as a child. Right? And I don't mean to say that my difficulties are worse than yours and yours are worse than mine. I, I, I don't care. It's just that the enemy tries to get us to look at each other and compare and judge. I look at, I look at some of you and I think, wow, you've had the life. I know every one of us have faced our difficulties. Stop looking at each other. Stop judging each other. The enemy works to break down our trust and place fear in our hearts and convince us that life just hasn't been fair. But it doesn't stop there. By the time I was halfway through my senior year in high school, I was angry. I was angry with the church, this church. My dad was pastor here. I was angry because the church stole my parents. They weren't present. They were so busy taking care of y'all. I say that facetiously. Most of you aren't here. Let me tell you how bad it got. We would be one day away on vacation, and there'd be an emergency at the church. They'd cancel our vacation and come home. One week out of the year. So I was so angry for a while that I asked my employer to schedule me on Sunday morning so I wouldn't have to attend church. I did that. It's true. Sorry about that, but I did. Then I realized that that wasn't gaining me anything, so I began to blame my parents. I was so angry at them for a long time. Then one evening they addressed my anger. After dinner they said, Steve, we need to talk. They said, we, we know that you're angry with us, and, and, and we know that we must have done some things wrong, and so would you share with us what you're angry about? I shared some things that I was upset about, and, and they asked, Steve, do, do you know we love you? And I said, yeah, of course. Do you know, I know you love me. And they said, well, everything we did was out of love for you, and, and we admit that we failed many times. Will you forgive us? Well, of course I will. Of course I will. Then they said, but wait. We did some things right, too. Let's start recounting some of the things we did right. I was pretty angry, and I didn't see a whole lot of right until we started remembering, and I love the reminiscing. When we were done, they said, okay, Steve, we want you to know that tonight we are giving you all of our loving failures and all of our loving successes. They are our gift to you. What you do with them now is up to you. And I felt the emotional crutches being kicked out from under me and my parents saying, support yourself, Steve. It's on you. You live in the failures or live in the successes. It's on you. The only one to be left to be angry at was God. And I had to decide whether I was going to trust that all the stuff that I went through could be used for my benefit. Or was God just mean? Did God love me or did he not love me? 
And the fact of the matter is that God loved me. He still loves me and he loves you. And everything we go through is used to build up our character, to tear down the arrogance that is in us and to build up our character. That's what I had to come to and that's what I came to. And I was set free. The enemy is working to get people to compare themselves to each other. To blame one another for our situations, the unfairness that we have. And when it all comes down to it, you got to deal with God. Because God allowed it. Oh yeah, there's some people that hurt. Sure. There's mistakes that are made. Sure. But when it all comes down to it, everything in our lives is either used for our blessing or for our destruction. We choose. I choose to believe God. In our culture war today, that's what's going on. They're trying to tear down the truth of the Bible and get us to look at each other and blame each other and push division into the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul says, don't do that. Instead, be like Jesus. Don't blame each other. Be like Jesus. Philippians 2, 3, second part of verse, in verse 4. In humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Huh. Don't look at your brothers and sisters in Christ and say it's your fault. I blame you for my situation. Stop the self-pity. Look at your brother and sister and say, wow, God values you, therefore I do too. I, I'm concerned about lifting you up because as you lift others up, you get lifted up as well. As I see it, God has placed his church in the right place for this time. Think about the political tensions. Think about the racial tensions, the economic tensions, in, in light of who we are in Christ Jesus. Galatians, Paul tells us, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and free female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this is not saying that there's no longer men and women. Uh, there are men and women. It's not saying that there are no longer different ethnicities and cultures. There are different ethnicities and cultures. It's not saying that there's no longer rich and poor. There are people who are well off and some that are not. What it is saying is that Everyone has the same value in Jesus. Everyone has the same value in Jesus. None are better than the other, which, which means that, that one of our ministries to the people in our time, people who have had their dignity stripped away, is to minister reconciliation to minister restoration. The Apostle Paul shares with us in 1 Corinthians 12 as he's talking about the body of Christ and how we minister to each other. He says that there, there are those who are unpresentable, those who have had their dignity stripped from them, and that we are to treat them with special modesty. We're, we're to give room and time for healing and restoration. That's the work of the body of Christ. As I look at what's going on in our world, I see God preparing us to be reconcilers. One who bridged the racial divide, the political divide, the economic divide. And we do that simply by living out Jesus' command, by following Jesus' teaching. We do that simply by being followers of Jesus. As I prayed about this message, God gave me a picture and a verse. 
the verse of 2 Corinthians 2.14, which says, But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Now think about this picture. It's a picture of a leader, a general of an army, having won the victory. He's won the victory, and now they're parading victoriously as he returns home. In this picture, you would see the government officials, the dignitaries, walking at the front of the parade. Follow, following them would be carts and carts full of the plunder from the battle. After the plunder would come all of the captives. Following the captives would be the general riding in a chariot pulled by four white stallions. Following the general would be all the soldiers. In most of these victory parades, the captives were beaten and humiliated. But in this parade, our captor, Jesus, has captured us with his love. He's captured us with his love, and he set us free from sin and death. We are part of the victory celebration. And all of the citizens of heaven are celebrating with us as, as we slowly make our way to our new home, our heavenly home. That's the picture. And all the people that are still under the control of the enemy look on. They look on and, and, and they look in awe. And some will have a longing for that freedom. And they're just waiting for somebody to invite them to be part of the parade. And, and some will look on and, and, and just detest what they see because they're not willing to surrender to the new king. Scripture says to one, it will smell like the aroma of life. To the other, the aroma of death. The difference is, will you receive Jesus or will you not? Will you put yourself as his captive? And join the celebration. In our day, at this very time, God has amplified the difference between those who have been captured by the love of Jesus and those who have not. That's what God is doing in our day. And God is calling us to celebrate and make known his love. That's what we're called to do. That's our part in what God is calling us to today and what God is doing today. You can look around, look all over, and you will see that it's true. You will see people trying to battle off what Jesus wants to do. But Jesus has already won. And we're part of the celebration parade. But a couple of weeks ago, as I was given that vision of the parade and, and the verse, I asked Jimmy to write a song about it. And uh, so he's going to come and share it with us now and invite us to sing along. So you guys come on up. So you want to know how we're to approach all the disasters we see around us? Worship. It's about us lifting up Jesus. It's about us loving him, and letting everybody know how much he loves us. We've got a battle. We're in it. Don't be convinced by the enemy. Don't, don't be distracted. We're in this parade inviting others to join in. And our future is clear, and we'll talk about that next week. Father God, as we go from this place, we ask that you would allow the words spoken to move our hearts. Allow your word to remain there forever. And Father, help us not to be discouraged. 
and help us know what our place is. That we may be worshipers, triumphantly processing through this life. God bless us, Lord, as we go. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.